Thank you very much. Um, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for inviting me to give you this talk. I um, recognize that I think uh, my topic is a little bit exotic here for, I guess, most of you. Um, but uh, yeah, let's give it a try. So what I want to oops, talk about um, today is um, what kind of study designs we use in air pollution epidemiology that are specifically useful in inf informing about um, the issue of causation. And because that is so strongly linked to evidence synthesis, I will just make a few very short remarks about evidence synthesis. And then finally, because that again is very much related to getting the numbers right, which means what is the actual size of the effect. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that, how to get unbiased population-based health effects in um, epidemiological studies. So um, to bring you a little bit up to speed on air pollution epidemiology, I'm going to start with a little introduction to air pollution. So I guess when you hear about air pollution, this is what you think about, I suppose. You know, traffic here, you know, what comes out of the tailpipe. Um, maybe you think about coal burning power plants <clears throat> or industry. Well, several things you probably do not think about are these here. So this is also air pollution here. The wear from tires, from brakes, from the, from the road. Um, Today in Germany, this is about half of the particles that come from traffic uh, do not come out of the tailpipe anymore, but they come from tire, road, and brake wear. Another thing you probably don't think about when you hear about air pollution is agriculture. One third to one half of air pollution we have in Germany and let's say in, um, in, in Europe comes from, air uh, comes from agriculture. And then finally, one of my favorites, um, this is also air pollution. Let's hope that the dog here is not the first victim of this nice um, wood-burning stove here. Um, that one causes a lot, oops, sorry, wrong direction. How do I get back? Yeah. Um, that's causing a lot of air pollution inside and outside um, due to current EU regulations classifying wood burning as a renewable energy. Thanks to that, um, by now about 20% of particles in German air come from wood burning. So um, sometimes you have to get away a little bit from air pollution to be able to see it. And here you can see it quite well. So this is what we are sitting in all day long from morning till evening, what we're breathing. Um, that doesn't, doesn't sound really good. And it's also um, the problem, you cannot evade air pollution, obviously. It's everywhere. And here's an example, you see these, you know, this is where we had uh, the wildfires in the summer um, this year in Canada. And um, here you see the smoke crossing the Atlantic Ocean and <clears throat> reaching Europe. So this is something um, you cannot get away from. It's pretty much everywhere. Um, a famous air pollution epidemiologist always says, air pollution is the only man-made object you can see from space with the naked eye. You cannot even see the Chinese wall, but air pollution you can see. So um, what is air pollution? Air pollution is a mixture of gases. Um, the most important ones are ozone, nitrogen dioxide, and um, sulfur dioxide and um, of particles, and these are the most important particles we look at in terms of regulation. I want to explain this a little bit more, you know, what these numbers here, what these acronyms mean. So the PM10 particles, this is a human hair in comparison, are the little blue balls here, and PM10 means this is particulate matter with a um, diameter of less than 10 micrometers. Um, and that's one of the particles that are being regulated. Now, if you look at these red dots here, these are the PM 2.5 particles. They are smaller than 2.5 micrometers. And then, once again here, you have these little dots here. These are the ultrafine particles. They are smaller than 100 nanometers. Why is that important? Well, it depends on what happens with these par particles. Now, if you step outside um, today, um, 
please expect to inhale about three million particles with every breath you take. Um, who's staying at the St Stieglitz Hotel? Okay, sorry for you guys. <laughs> expect to inhale, uh, you know, tonight you have probably inhaled about five million particles um, per breath, yeah? Um, so what happens then when you inhale these particles? Um, the larger ones, they, most of them, deposit in the upper airways and then you cough them up and swallow them. So they're, um, the larger ones are not the huge problem, but the smaller ones, they get into the lower airways, um, they even get into the alveoli, and the very small ones, the ultrafine particles, they are so small they can cross biologic membranes and get into your bloodstream, and from the bloodstream they can reach every organ. And what are they doing there? They cause oxidative stress, they cause inflammation, um, they are carcinogenic or they carry carcinogenic compounds on their large surface area, they activate um, nervous reflexes, and of note, as I said, they can, um, the, the, the particles, the compounds, and the inflammatory marker, the inflammatory mediators that they um, cause, they can be transferred via the bloodstream to faraway organs, including the brain and the placenta. And then, this is what you get. These are all the various health effects that you get from exposure to um, air pollution, and I don't want to play with your patients, and uh, we'll not go through all of this, but you see that pretty much all vital organs, including the pancreas here, which is not drawn, are affected by air pollution. So, now the big question. How do we know that this is causal? Um, so I googled um, co um, cause or correlation, and what you invariably get are these shocking news, uh, which to the uneducated eye, I may say, imply that eating ice cream is causing drowning. So don't eat ice cream anymore. Of course, we are educated people, and what we do is um, we draw a deck to look at this, to analyze this research question, which is, does ice cream cause drowning? And then with our deep subject matter knowledge, we um, say, okay, so hot weather causes ice cream, and um, hot weather always also causes wild swimming in unprotected waters, and that then, of course, causes drowning. So um, we know that this is a confounded pathway and that um, ice cream is not the cause of drowning. To put this in more general terms, and we have seen this deck before, um, we have an exposure, an outcome, and then a confounder. So what we usually do in epidemiology is um, that we adjust for these confounders. You know, with subject matter knowledge, we know what the important confounders are, we measure them, and then we take care of them either by design or in the analysis phase. Um, we adjust or we match or, um, you know, all kinds of things. We stratify. So, so this is one thing. Now, the other thing you can do is you can randomize and thereby you are um, yeah, deleting this association between confounder and, um, and exposure. And this is why we like randomized studies so much, because we have an equal distribution of potential confounders in the exposed and in the unexposed group. That's what we like. However, there are quite a few aspects of randomization that we do not like so much. Um, first of all, in humans, we usually do not allow randomized assignment of a potentially harmful exposure to people, and um, let alone do this for m many years um, on a, uh, you know, a, at a time. So that's just simply absolutely impossible. In the very few cases where we actually do um, randomize exposure um, to people, then that's um, usually only done for very short-term exposures, like a few hours in a chamber or something like that. And um, these are usually, uh, we only do this in, in highly selected populations. 
like in most cases, young people or medium-aged people or healthy workers um, or similar. So that's um, something we don't like so much about um, randomization. So what we can do, how can we get the best of these two worlds, make epi studies conceptually more uh, like randomized studies without the disadvantages of randomization. And this is where I want to show you a few um, study designs that have been applied in air pollution epidemiology that try to do exactly this. So the first one is the children's health study that's been conducted in Southern California, I think a place where we'd all rather be right now instead of, you know, cold Berlin. Um, now the investigators there, they've been following kids for, I think, since the 1990s, and they have conducted repeated um, uh, lung function testing in these kids between the time, the year of 10 and 18 years. Um, and at the same time, they have looked at their long-term exposure to air pollution at these children's residences. So what they saw then, um, what they got was this um, graph here. You can see on the x-axis the increasing um, concentration of nitrogen dioxide at these children's residences. And here you see the growth in lung function for girls and boys separately. And you see that the higher the air pollution exposure wa was, the lower the lung function growth was in these children. So far so good, that's just a regular epidemiological study that we know. And of course, the investigators thought a lot about all the important confounders, and they measured them, and they adjusted for them. But they went one step further, and they looked at the children that were relocating to other areas in the Southwest. Um, and these relocations, um, they didn't have anything to do with air pollution. They were purely related to the parents' jobs and living circumstances, you know, getting divorced and moving to the dad or moving to the mom. Um, and they were highly unlikely to be related to any potential confounders like smoking. I mean, there's no reason to believe that a kid that moved from a dirty place to a cleaner place, um, that here the parents all stopped smoking, whereas the kids that moved to a more dirty place the, the parents started smoking. I mean, that is um, highly unlikely. So here we have a case of pseudo-randomization where the change in exposure was unrelated um, to any potential conceivable confounders. And what did they find? Well, this is pretty much what we saw before. Um, the higher the change in exposure, so those kids that had an increase in exposure, the lower was their lung function growth during that time, between um, this time. So um, this is a, a pseudo-randomized study, and we see pretty much the same. Um, even, even though there's, or we, we do not expect any, any serious confounding here, and we the sa see the same thing as in the um, classical um, uh, epidemiological study. Um, another study where, by design, um, the uh, investigators got rid of confounding is this one here. So this is a study about long-term exposure to air pollution and mortality in the Medicare cohort, which is a cohort of um, over 65-year-olds, I think, in the U.S. Um, overall, they had um, 20 million subjects. They observed uh, 6 million deaths during the time between 2000 and 2010. So what did the investigators do? Um, this, these are the cities where the members of their cohort lived. And they um, used um, air pollution measurements in each of these cities. Um, and they averaged them for each city and for every single year. And then they assigned the yearly city-specific exposure fluctuations, so the year-to-year -year changes, to each enrollee of this cohort. 
Now, if we look at this in terms of our DAG, this is now the exposure. It's the city-specific, city-wide, year-to-year fluctuation in exposure. And that's the mortality here. Now, all the typical potential confounders <clears throat> that we usually have in these studies, um, they are pretty much taken care of by design. So what we, of course, would expect as a potential confounder would be difference between cities. Well, that's not the case anymore because we're using city-specific estimates. Then, of course, we have difference between participants, you know, smoking rates, um, physical activity, you know, all that. Um, well, that's taken care of because we are using, the, or they're using the city-wide um, exposure. So there is no association anymore between personal characteristics and the city-wide um, annual average. And then there would be differences between years, and these are also taken care of because they're looking at the year-to-year -year fluctuations in exposure. So that's um, an example how you can take care of any possible confounding by um, yeah, designing the study. And it becomes really hard to think of any, any um, confounder that's not captured um, through these, um, yeah, through these um, aspects of the study. A similar study was done in, uh, in the Lazio region in Italy. Um, so what they did, they modeled the long-term exposure for each municipality here in this region. This year is Rome, and they also um, modeled it for different districts of Rome, but that's not on this, on this figure here. And then they looked at the, they had the annual counts of deaths for each of these menu, uh, municipalities. And then very similar to the study before, um, they conducted a statistical analysis of the, of the fluctuations in exposure and the fluctuations in outcome. The only possible confounder here would be temperature, and that was actually then controlled for in the analysis phase. And something else the authors did, they also compared their results with results of the, a very traditional epidemiological analysis, and these were pretty much the same. Now, other causal modeling approaches are so-called pro propensity score modeling. Here you are trying to, you know, by, by weighing observations um, uh, depending on um, on the distribution of potential covariates or potential confounders, you're differently weighing the um, observations <clears throat> and thereby making the distribution of covariates equal across the exposed and the unexposed. One um, example of this, um, once again conducted in a Medicare cohort of 68 million people in the US, is this one here where they actually um, also looked at, uh, at uh, long-term exposure to air pollution and uh, mortality. And um, they used three different um, methods of uh, yeah, adjusting for the uh, weighing um, the propensity score. And they also did two you know, classical regression models. And the results were actually very similar again. Now a um, final, I think, yeah, a final um, causal modeling approach is using um, the instrumental variables that I want to show you here. So um, you have seen this before. This is our little confounder uh, triangle here. You have an exposure and an outcome, a um, potential confounder. And then here you have a uh, instrumental variable or uh, an another variable that is only related to the outcome via the exposure. So if you can conduct an analysis of, you know, the um, regression anal anal analysis of this variable um, on this outcome, it will not be confounded by C. Now, the difficulty here is to find the right instrument. That becomes difficult. But in air pollution, actually, um, we do have a few examples for that. So let's say that exposure is air pollution. The outcome is daily mortality. And one potential confounder is here the day of the week. Because we know that on Sundays, we have less air pollution and less mortality than 
for example, on Mondays. So what could an instrumental variable be for this case? Well, that is, for example, the wind speed. Um, on days with a little bit more wind, we have less air pollution. Um, or the other one would be the mixing height. That's the height of the, the lowest layer of air that we live and breathe in. <clears throat> and um, when, when the mixing height is very low, then the air pollution that's being produced by us gets concentrated more highly than when the mixing height is very high. So these are two very good instrumental variables that we can use, and it has been um, conducted in several studies, and it shows that um, there we see an association between wind speed or mixing height and um, daily mortality. Okay, so now I want to switch gear a little bit and talk about another line of research with our accountability studies. And these are studies, empirical studies, assessing the effect of a regulatory action or of a natural experiment. Um, in these accountability studies, um, yeah, you start with, you know, you have your regulatory action, whatever, it could be um, putting diesel particle filters on every car. Um, then you expect uh, reduced emissions of diesel particles. Um, you expect that ambient air quality will improve after that. Um, you expect that the exposure of the exposed population will decrease, and then you will expect uh, an improvement of the human health re response. And an accountability study tries to really follow and demonstrate all of these steps. Um, some famous and more historical examples, one example is the Dublin coal sales ban um, that was in the 80s when in Ireland it was, um, a, a regulation was passed to um, ban um, coal with a lot of, with a high sulfur content that actually led to a quite large improvement in air quality. Um, a similar thing was done in Hong Kong a while ago, sulfur content of, um, of fuels for cars. And then uh, another one you might be aware of, the traffic bans during the Beijing Olympics was also you know, one of those um, accountability or opportunities to conduct an, an accountability study. I want to show you one of the more recent examples. This is um, the California Ports and Goods Movement Plant in 2006. There was a, quite a comprehensive piece of regulation that um, uh, uh, regulated the basic, mainly the tailpipe emission, emissions from heavy duty traffic in California. Um, and so the, the heavy duty traffic, they had to put on, you know, whatever, scrubbers and, and particle filters and all kinds of things to reduce their emissions. Um, now this was specifically, um, the investigators looked at three different areas of um, California here. They looked at the red areas here. These were the so-called goods movements where heavy duty traffic was allowed and where we would expect after implementation of the regulation a substantial decrease in exposure. Then there were those um, orange regions um, that also had a lot of traffic, but there was no heavy duty traffic allowed. So they would expect a, a, a smaller decrease in emissions. Um, and then they looked at the gray areas here where uh, with little traffic where they didn't expect a large differences in exposure after this regulation. Um, then they looked at uh, 23,000 medical beneficiaries with chronic disease. So these were people that had asthma, coronary heart disease, hypertension, or whatever. Um, and they looked at the change in exposure after regulation coming into effect in these three areas where um, their, their, their cohort lived. And they also looked at the change in incidence in emergency room visits in these different three different groups of people. And what they saw was, indeed, the largest exposure reductions were in those 
called um, in, in those areas called the goods movement corridors. So these were the red areas. And they also observed the largest reductions in emergency room visits in people living in these red corridors. OK, now since we're in Berlin, I couldn't resist from showing you an, an accountability study that we are conducting here in Berlin right now. This is the so-called BEAR study, Berlin Brandenburg Airport, um, uh, Air Pollution Study. That's a natural crossover experiment. Um, some of you may know that in November 2020, the old international airport Tegel in Berlin um, closed. And within two weeks, all of the air traffic moved to the new Berlin airport, um, which is the Berlin Brandenburg airport down here in the south. So what we uh, can observe is, um, or what, what we did is, we looked at um, changes in air pollution concentration, specifically changes in ultrafine particles that come from air traffic. Um, and we looked at the area around Tegel Airport, um, the area around BER, so the new airport, and we looked at area at a uh, control area where we did not expect any changes in aircraft-related ultrafine particle exposure. Um, we conducted a, cro or we conducted, I mean, this is an ongoing study, we conducted a crossover study in 1,000 elementary school kids who go to schools either here or around Bear or in control area. Um, we do repeated lung function and cognitive function tests on these kids. And once we're done, which is going to be next year, um, we'll conduct a difference in difference analysis to check and to contrast changes in exposure and changes in health outcome in these um, three different groups of children. OK, so um, these are just a, a few um, epidemiological study designs um, that specifically inform about causation. I don't want to say that other studies don't, but these are just some um, specific examples. Now I just want to quickly talk about evidence synthesis. Um, now from what you've seen, I think, uh, I hope I could convince you that there's quite a bit of causal information that you also get from epidemiological studies. And um, when actually trying to determine is um, air pollution causally related to these health effects, um, we certainly shouldn't just you know, base our um, judgment on one single strain of evidence, but really look at the whole chain of evidence. And um, just as an example, I'm showing you this here. Let's just say we have a large cohort study that shows an association between air pollution at the residence and, for example, incidence of um, uh, cardiovascular disease of uh, myocardial infarctions and cardiovascular death. Um, so that's an important piece of information. Now, what is causing um, cardiovascular disease? The most important underlying pathology is um, um, is atherosclerosis, coronary, coronary atherosclerosis. So the next thing is we look at studies that measure coronary atherosclerosis, and we look whether we find an association between air pollution and the development of atherosclerosis. So we've done this, and, and where's my, where's Susanna? There she is. Um, she has conducted one of those studies, and um, yeah, so this is uh, um, showing, uh, indeed, yes, long-term air pollution causes an acceleration of the development of atherosclerosis. Then, on the other hand, we can look at, um, well, what happens when the air cleans up? And indeed, in accountability studies, we see that if the air gets cleaner, emergency room uh, ad uh, or, or hospital admissions um, get down. Now then, we'll go back in the chain of evidence and look at, well, what causes um, atherosclerosis? What are the biological mechanisms? So we look at studies that look at air pollution and various subclinical 
changes that we know are related to atherosclerosis. There can be um, blood pressure or arterial um, stiffness or uh, whatever, you know, you, blood sugar, um, diabetes. And here we can, either, we can do two things. We can do panel studies where people walk around freely and we just measure their blood pressure and their air pollution exposure um, on a regular basis. Or we can do this in a chamber where we expose people um, in a controlled, randomized exposure study um, for a few hours and then measure these outcomes. And this has been done and, and um, these two types of studies pretty much so exactly the same, that short-term exposure actually increases blood pressure. And then we go even one step further back and we look at animal experiments, and they also show the same. If we put uh, mice into a chamber and let them uh, breathe um, dirty air for six months, and then have the same type of mice in chambers, uh, let them breathe clean air for six months, we will see that the ones in the dirty air get way more atherosclerosis in their um, vessels than the mice that were in clean air. So we, we, this is, I think, a good example where we really can show that we need to look at the chain of evidence or adverse outcome pathway or triangulation or whatever is your favorite way of expressing this. Now, my final point, and I know I'm running out of time, is um, getting the numbers right. We really need to get unbiased population-based health effects because it's needed for regulation. I mean, we need to do something about this. So there's a desperate need in policymaking to get really the right um, number of, you know, what size of health effects are we talking about? Um, so we need the size of long-term health effects in the general population to calculate the burden of disease, to calculate or to do a cost-benefit analysis, which will then inform um, policy making and regulation. And the current burning example is the revision of the directive um, of, the, uh, of the air quality directive in Europe, which is currently ongoing um, as we speak. So um, this current process was based on a very elaborate um, burden of disease and cost-benefit analysis. And um, yeah, what I want to show you is an example how we can really get, um, get around this, this uh, selection bias issue, which is just as bad as confounding uh, or can be just as bad as in confounding by using so-called administrative cohorts. And I have an example here. This is from a huge um, study program that was, um, conduct uh, that was funded by the Health Effects Institute in Boston. It's effects of low levels of air pollution um, in three different huge studies. And we conducted uh, the study in Europe here, it's, which is called the ELAPS study. And uh, among others, we looked at these areas here where we had actually administrative cohorts. These are cohorts that do not depend on people coming into a study center and uh, following, actively following them up by phone calls or re-invitations. These are cohorts that are based on, for example, um, they can be based on population registries or on insurance data. Um, and they do not require an active follow-up by the investigators, but you can take, for example, um, the outcomes from registries, from population registers, and the like. Um, so we had these um, administrative cohorts in different countries across Europe uh, with huge numbers altogether. These were um, 28 million people. Um, and with these huge numbers, you can do um, you know, derive nice exposure response functions. Uh, you also usually have rich area-based um, confounder data on you know, socioeconomic status of the area people live in. Um, and you can, can conduct indirect adjustment, um, which is you know, a methodology I don't want to go into here right now. Um, but most importantly, you do not have any selection bias here because 
These are you know, full population samples. Now, what we did in, this, in, this, in these um, administrative cohorts, we looked at the long-term exposure at people's addresses and uh, mortality, among others, and this is what we found. Um, we saw that the effect sizes were quite a bit higher than previously estimated in, in other studies. Um, the effects went down to the lowest observable levels. We absolutely saw no threshold and the effect sizes were even higher at the low end of the exposure. Now, these findings are very important for burden of disease assessment. Um, so the European Commission conducted a health impact assessment for their revision of the ambient air quality directive, and this is what they used in their main analysis. They used the effect estimates that were published by WHO in uh, 2021. Now, when you look at the ELAPS effect estimates, they are quite a bit larger. They're, uh, for PM2.5, they're 50% larger, and here they're more than double. And that has a huge effect on um, burden of disease calculations, obviously. Um, an example here. So this is the main analysis burden of disease um, from PM2.5 using um, the WHO um, est effect estimate. And this is the one from ELAPS, so it's 40% uh, um, higher than um, in the main analysis. And for NO2, it's um, even more than double uh, the value of the original main analysis. So this shows how important it is to get the numbers right, and um, administrative cohorts are a very good um, solution because you don't have to struggle with um, uh, selection bias in these cohorts. So, coming to an end, seven reasons why I think epidemiology is so important for risk assessment. It's actually epidemiology, these are the only um, studies that uh, allow you to actually as, uh, investigate potentially hazardous uh, exposures. You can get evidence in unselected populations, you can get the size of the effect in the general population, and you can even identify susceptible um, population groups. Um, you can look at evidence of the effectiveness of interventions. Um, the EPI studies are the basis for calculation of burden of disease, and this then again is the basis for political decisions on priorities and prevention, and I guess that's what we are all after. Thank you very much.